we are excited today to have um, Kimberly Tanner and Aaron Dolan, and the topic is Collectively Improving Teaching. So I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Aaron Dolan that's going to host us. So Aaron, please get us started. Thanks very much, Sadella. So welcome to the first session of Online with LSE. The idea behind this is um, I'm, I'm representing CBE Life Sciences Education, and we're hoping to provide readers with and participants of this session with a sort of virtual journal club, a behind the scenes look into education studies. And we would like for everyone to post questions as you go. So please make sure you find that Q&A feature now and make active use of it. And we'll use that to drive the discussion today. Uh, like Sadella said, I'm here with Dr. Kimberly Tanner, who's graciously agreed to be the first author featured in this new webinar series. And she's going to introduce herself and talk a little bit about the motivation for the study, study that she is going to be talking about today. Kimberly? Yeah. So thank you for Sadella for organizing and Aaron for inviting me to come and um, talk about our work. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so I'm going to press this button. I'm going to stop sharing another screen. Here we go. Uh, and I just want to say a few words about myself and um, who I am as a person and why I ended up doing this kind of work. So Erin, can you see my screen? Um, I can see a screen. Hmm. It, let me see. Hang on a second. So I'm viewing an ASCB webinar screen. I'm not sure how I can take it over. Okay, so if you go to the share function, yeah. then you can say share your screens, qu qu quit sharing the other yeah. screen. Okay, I think go. we have it now. Boom. There we go. There we go. All right, super. Um, so I want to say a few words just about uh, who I am and where I come from and why, why I ended up doing this kind of work, and then a few words about the paper before we sort of mostly go into sort of trying to address some questions. So the, the title of the paper is called Collectively Improving Our Teaching, and the collectively part is uh, really important. I'm just here as a representative of a really lovely community of folks. Um, and then the, the title on this slide, Department-Wide Efforts in Scientific Teaching, is very much the focus of the paper. But what I'm not going to talk about is um, more details that we have about the, the details of the types of classroom transformations that it produced and unanticipated discoveries and other scholarly publications, but I'm happy to talk about this. So it's sort of one publication that came out of um, an effort among several that are still coming out. Um, and important things to know about me. So I think science is uh, a product of the people who do it, and it's absolutely influenced by who we are and our backgrounds and what we're interested in, which I think is critically important to doing great science. So important things to know about me are that I'm a first-generation college-going person. Uh, I was pretty lost through most of um, college. I didn't have a lot of guidance in that. Um, and so a lot of what I do in undergraduate education is trying to change that sort of position for lots of students in colleges and universities across the country. Um, someone, I don't know who it was, uh, asked me when I was a young person, a freshman, what are you going to do when you graduate? And I was like, the whole point was to go to college. Like, why are you asking that question? Uh, and so my pathway to science was because someone said, are you going to be a doctor? Or are you going to be a scientist? And I said, I grew up around hospitals because my parents are x-ray technicians and I don't really want to be around sick people. So what are these scientists people that you talk about? So uh, while other people have had maybe a more sort of direct path, my path to being a, a scientific researcher is, uh, is very different and it influences the way I think about this work. So I went and I uh, studied neuroscience uh, at the University of California at San Francisco. And while I was there, I had the fabulous opportunity to volunteer in K through 12 public schools here in San Francisco. And you might be like, Kimberly, what does this have to do with this paper? <laughs> uh, but that actually was really pivotal in my career path. And I um, actually decided to do a postdoc in science education because of those experiences. Uh, was happily involved in K through 12 science education for almost uh, a decade of my career. Uh, when I just talked to lots of teachers who were teaching based on the role models they had in their undergraduate science classrooms. So the only reason I find myself as a, the last step, discipline-based science education researcher um, is because I came to the university to understand how undergraduate um, teaching and learning was happening um, and to understand sort of how those decisions got made and to just really learn. Um, and so here's some on the slide are some of my uh, my work as a neurobiologist, which I don't think I've left behind. I think I've just traded in anesthetized rats for awake behaving humans. And um, so I still think uh, in, in, all of, in all of my work, uh, including this paper, very much in terms of neurobiology. So the ideas that drive our research efforts generally, which drive the, the background of this paper, and I'll just go through this quickly, are what drive a lot of people in our field, not everyone. 
Uh, depending on who you look at, what study you, you, you look at, twice as many undergrads leave the sciences and humanities in the U.S. That number is different depending on institutions, depending on how you measure it. But we lose really talented people who are statistically indistinguishable from the people who stay. And that's not a problem. I actually started college as a philosophy major. So leaving disciplines is okay. Like, that's fine. But as good scientists, we know that you shouldn't be able to predict who leaves based on personal characteristics. And that is uh, a big driver of our work, that you can still predict who leaves the sciences based on um, self-reported gender, ethnicity, cultural background. Two studies came out this year. Sexual orientation is a prediction of leaving in the sciences. So we're very, very concerned, not that everybody has to become a scientist, but that we don't want people to feel unwelcome or a lack of a sense of belonging that somehow causes them to leave based on their who they are and what they value. Um, most importantly, and I discovered this early on, very few scientists have formal training in effective teaching. And um, I think I've tried to be known worldwide. I have the backs of my fellow scientists. It's deeply unfair that we're trained to be outstanding scientists in this country. And then we're parachuted into classrooms and expected to know how to teach what we know to um, novices. And so this work very directly sort of addresses that issue. Um, and then there's a quote by someone who I've never met, uh, but has driven my work in really important ways. Uh, James Fairweather uh, from a publication that came out of the National Academies, who said the largest gain in learning productivity and STEM will come from convincing large majority of STEM faculty that currently teaches using lecturing to use any form of active or collaborative instruction. So I don't think there is any one right way to teach. I'm not interested in telling anyone how to teach. I don't think I'm the best teacher in my department, but I think we all need to think about how to have large numbers of us engaging students in different ways in classrooms. So that's a bit of the backdrop to this study, um, uh, which came out of two projects, uh, even though only one project's represented in the paper. And both of those projects were aimed at trying to engage biology faculty in explorations of scientific teaching. And I would say it started off more as a professional development effort uh, than a research project. Um, and so we have a lot of basic research in our lab um, about how to measure how students think about things or novel assessment tools, um, or even why science departments are hiring folks like myself. Um, but this started off, I think, more as a professional development project. And we thought very much about engaging faculty in these um, ideas that are down here in the graphic. So how to engage faculty in thinking like, what is active learning? What would that look like? What is assessment? What does that mean? Which can be a bad word on some campuses. Um, equity, diversity, inclusion, access. I could put a lot more words in there. How do we make everyone um, feel included in the classroom? How do we teach everyone who's there and not just the three people in the front row? And then collecting classroom evidence, which we always separate it out from assessment because uh, many people associate assessment with conceptual learning, but you can assess inclusion in a classroom and you can assess the extent to which active learning is happening. So we always sort of have pulled that out as a little bit separate. So we've done that um, through the gracious support of the National Science Foundation with um, community college faculty, which um, occurred because um, I never expected it, but master students coming out of my lab go on to be tenured community college faculty in the Bay Area, and lots of them. Um, so we started working initially with um, Jeff Shinsky, who's now at Foothill College, to support um, community college biology faculty and having a community and getting smarter about their teaching. That's sort of almost still ongoing. And then after hearing about that project and hearing about work with graduate teaching assistants, there were, um, oh, sorry, there, so it was about 30% of community college faculty in the Bay Area, about 24 institutions. So after hearing about that project, our work with TAs, then our own faculty, a subset of our own faculty said, Kimberly, and this is really kind of how it happened, could we come to the teaching workshops with the big cookies? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so cookies seem to be very really important. Don't underestimate the power of cookies. <laughs> the power of cookies. Um, and so I said, well, sure, of course. And I had been at San Francisco State about um, six years at that point. Um, and I think I had tried to build a reputation as a good colleague, a good scientist, someone who was not going to tell anybody how to teach. I had a pretty good trust level. I had co-taught with many folks, um, which I think was important and doesn't necessarily come out necessarily in the paper, but sort of this, I was this local science education expertise that didn't seem um, scary. And so I collaboratively uh, with my colleagues wrote this Howard Hughes Medical Institute grant, which formally was that sort of four year period. And that is what the paper is based on. So. Our lab has this sort of larger view. We've done work in lots of different arenas in professional development, and it came to fruition in some ways with this paper uh, specifically telling the story of what happened with our faculty. Now, the last uh, sort of uh, intellectual thing I'll say about the paper that's not there, it's what I like about journal clubs and interacting, and please, please put your questions up, is that there are key ideas that motivate work that don't ever quite make it into a paper. So some of these ideas are in there and some of them aren't. 
But a lot of our work is trying to, and a lot of the reason we ended up publishing this work, um, because in many ways, our professional development is based on great ideas that are in the literature, like um, great ideas that have, have a lot of research behind them. So what's new? But a big piece of why we published this was to try and get the community to think about these ideas, about moving away from what I would call a faculty deficit model. So when I would talk to people about my work, they would say, oh, our faculty don't care about teaching or that would never work with our faculty. And in fact, I think all we did was ask, right? And have high expectations and sort of move towards what I would call as a faculty asset model. And that language has a lot of parallels with students, but I think it is highly applicable for um, folks in discipline-based education research and folks who are doing professional development to sort of hold themselves to that same standard with faculty as we would with students. Um, similarly, there are lots of STEM-wide efforts that are wonderful. They're absolutely fabulous. Um, but uh, oftentimes they engage very small numbers of faculty across a lot of disciplines. So what happens then is we have you know, people who are maybe the early adopters or already innovative instructors involved in these projects, and we don't necessarily build a deep bench. <laughs> and so we wanted to work really hard to see if we could get like the depth in our department, like lots of different kinds of people, not people who necessarily say have super strong identities with teaching, to engage in doing what James Fairweather said, which is making really small changes in their teaching. So that's why we've tended to be discipline specific. And I am really interested in always asking like, well, what proportion of faculty are doing anything different? Um, I think a big piece of this paper and what's intriguing to people about it is we tried very hard to move away from faculty as subjects or participants and engage them more as collaborators and co-investigators. Um, so that, because none of this work could have happened with just myself and postdocs or graduate students, it absolutely was dependent on having a huge community of people collecting evidence, lots of different kinds of evidence in lots of different ways. It just would not have been possible without that stance. And that relates to the final thing I'll say, which is that I think in trying to get more faculty to see themselves as part of this work, um, then engaging them in projects like this hopefully are moving away from a low alignment of biology or science education efforts uh, aligning with their professional identity, like what they see as core to their work, and having really higher alignment with their professional identity. Um, and in many ways, having them collect evidence and be involved in analysis and building novel assessment tools, that feels super familiar, I think, to many of my faculty because that's what they do as researchers all the time. So. The last thing I'll say and then we'll go to questions is, um, this is the title of the paper, Collectively Improving Our Teaching, Attempting. And we say attempting because we're still very much in the process. This is sort of a snapshot of where we were at a particular point in time. Attempting biology department-wide professional development and scientific teaching. And I have to say, um, I'm here on behalf of, I'm so incredibly um, proud of all the people that I work with and my department. I always get a little verklempt when I say this part. Um, and I have to say that all these people just fabulous and varying degrees of ways they think about scientific teaching, varying degrees of what they do in their classrooms. Um, and there are a couple people I just have to absolutely highlight. Carmen Domingo is the, was the, my co-investigator investigator, sort of PI, if you will, on the HHMI grant because she was the associate chair of our department. And Carmen was absolutely critical. Um, she's here in spirit. I'll see her this afternoon. I'll tell her how it went. She's now the interim dean of the College of Science and Engineering. So she was associate chair at that point. And so her leadership was absolutely uh, uh, critical. The, there were... Uh, several postdocs who were involved in this project uh, over the course of the time. And um, I'm gonna highlight um, three of them here, Gloria Trujillo and Shan Seidel helped launch this whole project, uh, really critical in collecting evidence and thinking about um, ways to ask these questions. Colin Harrison came in in the second wave with Melinda Owens. Um, they're all off doing fabulous, wonderful things. Um, and Melinda Owens as first author took a really Herculean sort of job of working with all of us uh, myself and Carmen especially to kind of pull this together into a paper and she's off traveling in New Zealand go Melinda so uh, but um, she deserves a huge amount of credit so I will um, stop there I will stop sharing my slides um, and we'll uh, turn towards having uh, some more interaction and questions which I am happy to answer uh, anything that comes up for people Great, thank you. Um, so some folks submitted questions in advance and people are already submitting questions um, in the Q&A box. So thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could start just by talking a little bit. You, you've commented on administrative support, um, cookies, the value of cookies. <laughs> um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about how you managed to recruit so many of your colleagues to participate both in the professional development and in the study itself? Right, yeah, I think mean, it's a very common question and it's part of why actually in the paper there is a motivation survey that we did kind of post 
hawk because we got this question so much. And so it's not perfect data, but it's at least some insight. Um, our external evaluator, which we had an external evaluator, uh, Loretta Kelly, who's uh, um, on the paper as well. Um, a big piece of it, I think, was community. And that comes out in the data from faculty. So I think I initially hypothesized, oh, well, the way you get people to the table is you'll have money. And so there are absolutely stipends involved. They weren't um, you know, terribly large in some ways. Um, but the sense of community that everybody was going and there was kind of this, uh, we're all gonna go together. It wasn't like a subset. We didn't select kind of like a small group of thought leaders. I've seen that sort of model in grants and in other places and I'm not saying that doesn't work, but it was sort of a community effort. So you kind of wanted to be there um, because you know everybody was invited um, and it was something that, um, that you didn't want to miss out on, I think there was a feeling. Um, I think that the, how to get large numbers of people. I also think that in my career in K through 12 science education, I spent a lot of time as a program coordinator. And I actually think an invisible thing that's not in this paper is just understanding how to wrangle humans, <laughs> right? Like that you don't just send one email, but you send multiple follow-up emails and you support people and you see them in the hall and say, I'm so looking forward to seeing you on Friday. I just actually said that to someone in the hall about an event. And so there are some invisible pieces to, I think, just how to organize humans that a lot of researchers have no training in, scientists don't have training in. And I happen to have the luxury and benefit of working with some really talented mentors who taught me how to get people in a room. Um, and then once they're in the room, you have, to do, you have to do things that are helpful to them. And I will say the second thing that um, both the external evaluator and I think it comes out some in the paper that was important was that we only did those things that were, we could ground in evidence from faculty. So like it, the project started with a series of workshops because I'm like, why would anybody come to anything for more than an hour or two? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't go unless I knew it was a good use of my time. And so all of those workshops were based on needs assessments, like preliminary surveys about what are you struggling with? What would you most like to um, talk with your colleagues about? What cool insights would you like to share? So it wasn't like, hey, come learn from Kimberly and Carmen. They have all the answers. It was like, we're going to convene this community to share expertise. It's, uh, it's, why don't we have time to talk about teaching? It's a huge part of our job. And so every workshop we started, we could put up evidence from faculty, which would never get published in a paper, to say, hey, 85% of you say you're really struggling with how to engage all the students in your classroom and not sort of a subset of dominant students. So today we're gonna work on that. And so I think that bought some cultural capital because it was always built in response to what faculty's needs were as best we could. And, and, the, and the study itself was a natural follow on from the professional development. Yes, it was. And I think that's the place where, you know, much of the research that I publish is super basic kind of research. Many people probably don't even read those papers, but this- uh -huh. That's not true, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, but it's, you know, it can feel like very, very, um, you know, somewhat isolated. Like I haven't done, and my lab doesn't do a lot of intervention research, for example. Like we've always studied learning more than we study teaching is the way I often express it. And this is sort of the first sets of things where we started um, studying teaching. Um, and I say that because I think it's much more emergent than the, the other projects that we do. It's not like we submitted the HHMI grant and said, we're going to publish four papers on these things. Every paper that we've published has been uh, an emergent reset of research questions that were really important for us to be able to address to do a good job. And then we made discoveries in the process. It's kind of like the way science is supposed to work, but mm -hmm. you know, then it worked that way. Yeah, um, absolutely. So like some of the measures in here, you know, there's actually only one. So the two discoveries we made that, uh, that are, were, were sort of independent of this, figure five, which was about measuring the extent to which people are doing anything beyond lecturing with classroom noise, like that wasn't in the original grant. We just had to find a way. Faculty said, Kimberly, are we doing anything different in our classrooms? Like we go to the big cookie workshops. We've been to the Institute. We're watching each other teach. We're, you know, there are small things that we're all doing differently. We're using name tense and we're trying to do think pair shares, but really how, what proportion of you are doing anything beyond lecturing? That was a question asked by a faculty member in a workshop in the sort of a follow-up program piece. And DART sort of emerged as a way that we could safely, right, really safe. Nobody wanted somebody to come watch everybody teach safely, cheaply, systematically make some kind of measure. And so that DART, Decibel Analysis for Research and Teaching, never in the original grant, never kind of in the original um, idea, but a critical emergent research program. Lovely, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and we have a, a participant online who has asked a question about um, 
part-time versus full-time faculty and maybe you can comment a little bit on how much part-time faculty were involved and whether you know what if you were going to explore this with a, a group of faculty that involves more part-time faculty how you would address that. Yes, absolutely. Anjali, thank you um, so much for the question. So I think that um, some of this is language. So I use the term faculty to include uh, tenure track, lectures, part-time faculty, all those folks. So in our own personal culture, and this was purposeful, we're all faculty. Um, and so in the paper, um, we actually had 39 in, in the form. I'm actually going to look at the table because I can't remember these numbers, but we have about 40 um, tenure, tenure track faculty, and we had about 20 what I would call long-term lecturers and or short-term lecturers. Um, and so while it's not as um, the same sort of profile as a community college, for example, we have um, those part-time folks. So at some level, maybe that's invisible, um, but we have people in a variety of different kinds of positions that were included in the study. So I think the purposeful thing we did, and this actually comes out in some data that's not in the paper, some evidence, more like program evaluation, is that our, it was really important for our lecturers to be included just like anyone else. Um, so in faculty governance in our department, it sometimes becomes a little unclear. And like sometimes we'll have faculty meetings and then we have to do some RTP thing and then the lecturers leave. And that always feels really bad to me. And so mm -hmm. Um, in part because I have been well trained by my community college colleagues, like we tried to, at some level, wa not, not wash away, but be inclusive that everybody was considered faculty and everybody was invited. Uh, pragmatically, that meant that for like, like the follow on workshops and the professional learning communities, we often offered it twice. So we would do it 1230 to two on Tuesdays, because that's the time where tenure track faculty were supposed to have time clear. And we would do it four to 530 over, the, over that kind of hour. Um, at the request, like that time was chosen um, by some of our lecturers because they were teaching at the noon hour. And so we actually did things in duplicate for access. When you look, when I ask people to predict like who would participate in this and what percentage, oftentimes people will, will say, oh, Kimberly, you have 40 tenure track faculty and 20 lecturers. It's only going to be the lecturers because they're the only ones interested in teaching and they'll guess like 30%. And in fact, when you look at the data, there's a higher proportion of tenure track faculty that participated a little bit, not in a big way. Mm -hmm. And what we discovered was the part-time tenure track, I mean, the part-time lecturer folks, they're so busy. They don't have, they're teaching so much. It's harder for them to make time to come to some of these things. So we worked really hard to make it accessible. Um, but I will say also in the previous NSF project with Jeff Shinsky, who was originally at De Anza College, he's now at Foothill, about 75% of um, community college faculty around here are part-time and 25% are full-time. And we never wrote a paper on it and we didn't do department specific things, but I, I don't think that things would work very differently given our experience with community college faculty. You just have to ask and have people feel included. And if you have sort of a more specific um, concern that I'm missing, I'm, I'm happy to address. Great, thanks. Yeah. So you, you brought up a couple of times this idea of more applied or sort of intervention research mm -hmm. or um, more basic research. So this probably sounds more like an intervention study, right? Because you have the FUST that you're implementing um, and yet you're also studying it in the process. And one of the challenges I think a lot of folks face when they're implementing an intervention or some experience and they want to study it, they're worried about changing it. You know, what's the it? And am I being true to the it as I evolve the study um, and learn things? So can you comment a little bit about how you manage to think about and be responsive with the professional development while still being true to the study? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is a place where there are, um, there are folks with different expertise than me who, um, who should chime in on the Q&A in the chat. Please, please chime yeah, in. Yeah, please ask please questions. Um, so I think that um, this was what I would, I would call a much more emergent study. Mm -hmm. um, so there are people who do studies where um, they randomize, maybe, maybe, they, maybe there are people who do studies. You could design a study where you're <laughs> randomizing faculty into something. I've gotten that feedback on grant reviews. I don't know how to do that and get large proportions of people to participate. And so, um, so in our realm, because the idea was grounded in scientific teaching to have it be responsive to the people who are coming, you know, we students in a classroom, in this case, it's faculty and professional development, then by definition, the study has to, um, the nature of the intervention is changing and the study is to try and capture evidence around that. So it is a very 
different type of um, research in that sense. Um, and in that sense, much more applied or emergent. I don't know exactly how to say it. Um, I think the concern with lots of things that are, you know, more like somehow random. So, so I've been asked like, well, why don't you randomize faculty into to different kind of pieces of this? And I think that's a place where two things come up for me. One is faculty are not equivalent, right? Like we're people with really important personal values and drivers and that we could somehow consider that equivalent is, um, does not mesh with my experience. And the second thing is that a huge amount of professional development is about trust. Um, and I think that having that sort of level of um, trust involves a, a collaboration and a partnership. Um, that means that I, as a researcher, can, am not going to predetermine things. So it's moved much more towards, and I don't want to misuse this term, but it's more in the spirit of community-based participatory research. Mm -hmm. It's not, I think, purely that. That's a term that's, that's used more in um, social science and medical communities. And so I, don't, I feel like I, sh I should not own that term. But it is more in the sense of um, driven by the community. Um, and the community is uh, participating in it. And I don't think that we took it completely to that extreme, but we sort of moved in that direction more than maybe um, people would think of traditional research on professional development as doing. Absolutely. So um, uh, related to that, actually, uh, people are asking about your um, sort of how, whether you'd be willing to share the surveys you use throughout the project, the background, the context, what people cared about, so that people can really see, one of the things I really liked about the way you wrote your paper is you made that emergent process really transparent. Yeah. Um, but, you know, would you be willing to share some of those tools or talk oh, through that? Yeah, yeah, that's kind of a, that's like a fault of ours, right? Like, I, we've never written a paper like this before, so like, you know, probably we should have put in way more of those in appendices, but I'm looking and Beth Ann is asking like, oh, at Wyoming, there are a bunch of us in a room and I'm glad, hopefully you're talking over us. <laughs> you should be chatting, uh, but I'm happy to share uh, any, any of that sort of stuff. I will say those surveys were um, face validated. So what that means is that we definitely piloted out with some um, instructor colleagues, usually community college folks, right? Who are ours to kind of make sure that the questions made sense. Um, but they were needs assessment surveys. So most of them were pretty straightforward in terms of face validity, but I'm absolutely happy to share. I mean, some of the early ones were like, would you come to a two day scientific teaching institute, a three day scientific teaching institute, a four day, a five day. And I'll never forget like the data on that. Here's an example of where we didn't follow the data. The data on that was like, well, I would come to something that's like a three day. And my colleague Carmen is like, damn, I'm sure we can get them to come for five days. <laughs> so, so the original <laughs> institutes, we kind of threw caution in the wind uh, because the community, we had been doing scientific teaching institutes for community college faculty here in the Bay Area for many years. And it was a five day institute. We started with introduction scientific teaching, then we dove into assessment because that's where people kind of were able to put their science skills to work. And then we got to uh, issues of equity inclusion, even though we kind of covered that the whole time. Uh, we really focused on it. Then we talked briefly about active learning, but we're doing active learning the whole time. And we've spent the last uh, day and a half really translating, like, how are you going to translate this to your classroom? And then there was always follow up. So we kind of wanted to keep that model that we had developed with a uh, five day Institute of community college folks. I will say that over time, now that we've had large numbers of people do the five day, both community college and faculty, we've gone back to our data, we've streamlined it, and now we've got it down to three days to try and be able to get more pe more different types of people to do it and to try and, um, for example, we just had 50 faculty from across SFSU, from history and English and oh, wow. computer science, um, to try it out with them. And you can just wow. get a much broader population of people with three days. So, But I'm happy to share uh, any of those tools, which I would not say are I would not say they're research grade assessments, but they are very, very well face validated assessments. Um, well, and they were functional for what you were trying to accomplish, which is I think what your goal was. Yeah, because sometimes, you know, there's a world in which people like, they want to say like, well, this is valid and reliable. And I'm like, I actually haven't measured reliability on these things. And I think sometimes you don't, that's not kind of your major goal. Like there, there are times where reliability is really critical to research questions, but they are very face valid. And I think that's the most kind of critical piece. And, and maybe would need to be re, re face validated with different audiences, right? I mean, if you're yeah. thinking about reaching different groups of people, you might have to revisit that. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, let's dive into the, some of the nitty gritty on the paper a little bit, sure. um, specifically related to the methods. So you decided to use self-reports of teaching, student assessment of teaching, and recordings of classroom noise. 
And this gets at one of the questions that one of our participants is asking about sort of what the criteria are for active learning in terms of classroom noise. Or maybe you can talk about how you use those three data sources right. um, and how they're related to one another. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, uh, and this is another question I think someone had sent in sort of previously, which is like, you know, how did you do, decide to use all these different measures? And so I'll get to, um, Susanna has this lovely question about what's the criteria for active learning with classroom noise. And so I'll end with that. But I, we, we, uh, we wanted to triangulate <laughs> so I think with humans, it's very complicated. We're, I'm a neurobiologist. I think we're different people on different days. Like if I've done my job and students leave my class, they're a different person than they came in. So that makes reliability actually really challenging. Um, so we wanted to triangulate and have a lot of different measures that might help us understand if we were moving in the direction that we thought we were moving. So the low hanging fruit was you, is you ask faculty about their, um, their ideas about what they're learning and what they're changing. And that serves um, two purposes at least, but the number one was metacognitive reflection by faculty. So I would ask those questions even if I wasn't doing a research project because uh, when I ask those questions of myself, I discover things that I hadn't realized, like uh, assumptions I'm making, things that I'm doing I didn't realize. And so that was part of the professional development tool, but that's the first line of evidence is just what did faculty report learning and changing. Um, then we're all well fam familiar with uh, multiple papers that suggest that faculty sort of self reports about what they're doing are often underestimates of, of maybe what someone else would say if they came into a classroom. Um, and so we wanted to not stick with just that. Um, so we actually then embarked on this large scale what we call the student faculty perception survey. And so every spring now, we actually, every student in a biology class is invited to respond to a series of questions. I'm happy to share that survey. I think that's in, that might have been in the appendix. Uh, and we asked faculty as well. And that's where we wanted to say, hey, well, if faculty are saying that they're doing pair discussions like almost every class period, then what do the students say in their class? And I gotta say kudos to our faculty because this is a place where people could have said no. Like that makes me too nervous. Like I don't want to have that kind of data collected. The postdocs in this project, Shannon Seidel, Gloria Trujillo, Colin Harrison, and Melinda Owens were absolutely critical because they were this um, buffer. So we could always say, Carmen Domingo and myself could always say, we'll never know whose data is what. We don't want to know, right? We're trying to get smarter as a community. Only the postdocs will have the key. And so the postdocs, I think, made it super safe. And my faculty really got behind. Everybody loved our postdocs. And they're like, well, I gotta, we got to do this because postdocs got to get jobs, you know? <laughs> you're helping us with all this. Like, we're going to need to, like, have publications and stuff. And so I, I'm so proud of my department and how they rallied. But the postdocs, um, preserving anonymity was really key. But then we could say, to what extent do the faculty's perceptions of what they're doing match with the students in their classrooms? And lo and behold, it matched pretty well. So... Um, there are all sorts of critiques and questions you could have about that, but that was the second line of evidence. Um, and then the third, the, one of the, I get the third line of evidence I'll sort of jump to is this classroom noise piece, which I alluded to earlier was we wanted to know like, well, can't really are we doing anything beyond lecture, right? Like the expectation was not for everyone to all of a sudden do 100% cooperative learning in their classroom. That's not what you would see if you came here and that's not what my classroom looks like. Uh, but we wanted a quick and easy way to measure it. And there are tons of beautiful protocols. I can't say enough about my colleagues in biology education research. We have a lot of fabulous protocols out there that measure all sorts of different things. And I think they're lovely and they're beautiful. Um, for our purposes to do wide scale, like measure something every class session from every faculty member in every course in our department, mm -hmm. we just, I mean, maybe fancier institutions could do it, but we just didn't have anywhere near that capacity. So mm -hmm. noise, we had observed for a long time, going way back to my, to my early days, I would always draw on the board, we would do a pair discussion at the beginning of anything we did, and I would draw a, on the board a graph, and the y-axis would be noise, and the x-axis would be time, and I would make a joke about, okay, so what you just did was a think, pair, share, and here it's quiet, and then when I ask you a question you don't understand, it goes up and it comes right back down like an impulse function. It would buy me a lot of cultural capital because I was drawing a graph, mm -hmm. I was being quantitative, I was using variables, I was joking about impulse functions, so yeah. probably I was... Do using it. language that engender buy-in, yeah. Trying to get some buy-in, but uh, you know, I remember the day that Jeff Shinsky and Shannon Seidel and I believe Gloria Trujillo was there and myself, I had drawn that graph and we looked at each other and we're like, wow, we should really science up and just measure that. And it, it came at a time that a faculty member had sort of asked this question, like how, how could we measure this? And so to get to Suzanne's question, sorry, cause it's scrolling down. Um, our criteria for active learning in the classroom noise was, um, 
we, we built this machine learning based algorithm in collaboration with Mike Wong and the Center for Computing Life Sciences here at San Francisco State, absolutely um, critical. And um, it turns out you can characterize based on just the mm, amplitude of the noise and the variance of that amplitude, it tends to fall into three categories of, of um, uh, types of uh, noise. One would be single voice where you get kind of an average uh, amplitude and a really high variance. Like right now there's high variance because I'm breathing, <gasps> thank God. So occasionally it's quiet, our brain kind of fills it in, but it's sort of going up and down. Whereas no voice, we call it, is really low amplitude and low variance. So that's really just quiet. That's low amplitude and low variance. It can be easily interrupted. And then multi-voice, uh, which has high amplitude and low variance. And that's usually where you have many speakers all talking at once. So if you have 300 people in a room and you're doing a pair discussion, it's 150 voices. So the amplitude goes way up and somebody's always talking. So the variance is low because it's always kind of on the top. So we, we have argued in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences paper that was on this noise analysis that both no voice and multi-voice, we would consider active learning. And now that doesn't mean that, uh, I, I'm sort of hesitant to go beyond that, but that's kind of how we interpret it. Um, because I think of active learning uh, at the intersection of equity and inclusion. Active learning has to be when every brain has a chance to think or every brain has a chance to talk. That's why more Socratic methods, um, which would be would come out as single voice. I personally don't see that as active learning because it is still a subset of people driving what the brain is experiencing, sort of drives a subset of people talking and everyone else sort of observing. So I don't know if that answers your question, Susanna. And there are all sorts of interesting research questions around that. So we're just we're just getting started on that. That's great, thank you. And I'm gonna combine the next two questions because I think they get at an issue that also was submitted as a question in advance, which is you have a pretty unique set of skills and knowledge um, based on your program coordination experience mm -hmm. and also your particular role in the department as a, and as a biology education scholar. So the next two questions really relate to what could you know, the typical person do or a person that may not have that position of power that you have that want to, uh, wants to affect the kind of change that you're, you're helping to affect and, and, and you and, your, and the whole team that you have multiply, you know, multiple times given credit to. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that um, it's so funny because I, when I came here 14 years ago, like I, I mean, I was low status. Like I would go to committee meetings uh, in, D, you know, in DC or at like a professional society. And I was an academic coordinator at a university. I was a staff person. And, um, and so I, I don't think I changed a, lo a lot from being a staff person. I just sort of moved institutions. And so when I came here, was, I didn't, I think I, I get perceived as having a lot of power, but I'm, I'm not sure that there's anything super special about me. Absolutely, I have some expertise in science education. And I think I also had a, a willingness to try and learn and understand what faculty were experiencing and thinking about. And um, I've tried very hard. I probably failed, but to not like walk in and tell anybody how they should be doing anything. Like I think that was the most important thing that I didn't do. So I actually think plenty of folks can have this kind of impact. I don't think I'm super special. Um, I think that, um, and that's easy for me to say, and that's me you have to believe it, because now I'm 14 years in. But I will say we started this work when I was six years in. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're seeing, this is the nature of publications. You're seeing the publications at a point in my career that is super different than when I started the work. And so I started this, like, I think I was invited to, uh, somebody said about the big cookie joke, that was like right as I turned in a tenure packet. And I didn't even plan on staying here till tenure. I thought I would probably be gone in five or six years. <laughs> but I've loved my colleagues and I've learned so much from them and from doing it. So. Uh, I don't think you have to be super special. Um, I, I also want to acknowledge my privilege. It's absolutely a privilege that I was a tenure track person and that can feel really, really different in an apartment. I also think though that as the science education person, um, partnering with Carmen was really important, right? So I didn't say like, hey, this is like Kimberly's lab show or Kimberly's show. It was a departmental effort. And the Hughes grant was kind of nice because Hughes doesn't really sign. They don't give grants to people. That wasn't my grant. That was a department grant. Mm -hmm. And we emphasize that a lot in the language. So I think partnerships with people who are in 
positions that um, are tasked with this kind of work or these kinds of ideas is really important. So, um, so those partnerships are really key. And I think more important than me was having, once again, I'll just emphasize, I think the postdocs were critical, having sort of this neutral party set or this group of really thoughtful young scientists who could help us get smarter about how teaching was happening in our department. Like that was sort of the party line. Like all of my faculty, I've never met a scientist that doesn't love their discipline. I haven't. And when a scientist loves their discipline, they want to be the best ambassador for that discipline they can be. For their kids' significant other, for their cousins, for the people at the grocery store, for their students. And so I think maybe the there's, I don't think there's necessarily something super special about me, but that language or that stance, I think, was really important, and that sort of developed over time. Oh I, don't know. That's the, I don't know how to stop there. I will say um, I work with lots of really talented people who are adjuncts, part-time, community college faculty, postdocs, graduate students who have fomented and fostered change in their local corner in amazing ways, and so... If there's anything I can do to be a thought partner for that, I'm happy to do it. I don't have all the answers, but please, please know that your passion and your thoughtfulness can take you very, very far. So, so speaking of, uh, you mentioned graduate students, and there's a specific question about what graduate students can do. Can you comment about uh, maybe some ideas that you have there? Yeah, I think in many ways. So this is also the backstory of research, which is why I wish this were... I like the chat window, but I'm missing like interacting with more people. But this is why doing journal clubs like this is really important because I actually think the graduate students drove this whole project and there was no, I couldn't have any evidence to put that in the paper. But when I first landed here, we had an NSF GK12 project mm -hmm. and the NSF GK12 projects, there were many all over the country, it was a fabulous project, um, was to partner graduate students with middle, well, K through 12 teachers for 15 hours a week, it was a huge time commitment, but then the graduate students got a $30,000 a year stipend. It was really fascinating um, project. Rita Colwell was the champion of it at the NSF. So when I landed here in 2004, there was already a GK12 project. So right, so John Stubbs, and, um, who was one of the people on my hiring committee was a fabulous leader in that, he's now retired. And I got brought in to help do that project because I had a lot of experience partnering scientists with K-12 folks. Um, so we built a course called Science Teaching for Scientists. We had GK-12ers out in the schools. Um, and some of the requests for, hey, Kimberly, can we go to the workshops of the big cookies were because those graduate students would take what they learn and the projects we were doing back to their labs. And they would talk to their PIs about it. Or they would say, hey, you know, in our lab meeting, our undergrads aren't really talking. Can we do a quick pair share so that they can have a chance to talk? Yeah. So I think graduate students, uh, in many ways can sort of um, drive things. I will, I will say I am often invited to go give a, a research seminar at a research one institution by groups of graduate students. Mm -hmm. And then I offered to do a pedagogy workshop and then faculty show up there. And I've had multiple institutions where then I get invited back by the faculty because they weren't really in involved in the first sort of uh, invitation by the grad students, but they're like, hey, that's kind of cool. That's sort of interesting. And like, you guys published up PNAS and I don't know what that is. And, and then I end up going back. And so I think it's intangible in this paper because I, we didn't study it, but I think graduate students are absolutely um, a conduit of innovative ideas to faculty members who uh, may not be directly interacting with programs and things like that. Um, I will say, I just got through, the last thing I'll say, I just got through working with 60, or 60 so talented, really lovely um, postdocs and graduate students at Stanford University. We did a scientific teaching institute, a three day there for them in partnership. Uh, and I have got, we're collecting evidence right now, our one month sort of post assessment to see what people remember and what they're applying and what they're not applying. Uh, and I would say a third of those uh, folks are implementing those kinds of things sort of based on either emails with them or data from the survey that's just rolling in, in their lab meetings. Right, they're starting to get their faculty members to think about doing things differently around inclusion and active learning and assessment, not even necessarily in the context of an undergrad class, but just how we function in the culture of science. And that's incredibly powerful. And graduate students can ask those questions. 
Lovely. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah. So you commented about one of the, I want to focus in, in the remaining time because we don't have very much time left um, on sort of next steps for both professional development programming and next steps for the research. And so one question that was submitted online related to how do you um, reach across disciplinary or departmental boundaries. And you mentioned that one of the next uh, steps for professional development was actually involving people from all different disciplines. So can you comment a little bit on that? Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think this is where there are people with lots of expertise. I have lots of dear colleagues who have worked in STEM professional development, right? And I've worked very much sort of uh, in sort of a discipline specific biology way. So there's so much expertise and lovely work going on. Um, I think that um, we, I think one of the key things that I have found Mm, and it's kind of in this paper, but maybe it's kind of not, is that if I can engage a, an instructor in, if I can give the instructor the skills to figure out how students are thinking through assessment, although I don't necessarily use that word, an index card, <laughs> mm -hmm. bigger question, and they can sort of pull back the veil on how students are really thinking about the discipline, then they get very, very engaged. And so assessment is oftentimes this entryway into professional development. However, Assessment requires really deep understanding mm -hmm. of the, the content. Yeah, so, absolutely. you know, like I know that for biology, I was a biochemistry undergrad. And so I, we worked with about a third of the chemistry faculty here. But when you start to jump disciplines, then that feels very, very different. And that's where you, I think you have to have this authentic somebody that's not somebody in that discipline who understands deeply the nature of the concepts and, and the challenges. Um, I'm mean, using the word misconceptions or alternative conceptions. Um, the learning outcomes has to be at the forefront of the professional development. And I will say this summer, when we had 50 folks uh, from across San Francisco State, there were certainly biologists and chemists there, but um, really thoughtful people from theater, nursing, um, I could go on and on. Um, you know, we got through the assessment day, but that definitely was the weaker link, right? Yeah. Because, yeah. Um, because we, we were able to, to foster conversations about that, but, but that piece is just so tied to the discipline. And so I think the key to sort of moving across then is having partnerships. I'm just a huge believer in partnerships where folks who have maybe some uh, assessment skills from their discipline, people who have assessment skills from another discipline, then collaborate to try and figure out how that translation happens. It's very, very different um, to think about assessment in physics, computer science, mathematics, just even within STEM, than to think about it in terms of biology and chemistry, I think. And so I, I, I try and go to lots of meetings and learn a lot, but I think that those types of interdisciplinary conversations uh, are ones I'm trying to broker because I don't think it's possible for anybody to do it alone. I think the disciplinary expertise is really critical. Absolutely, absolutely. Tell you what, let's spend the last question, our last uh, sort of question focused on this, this question from our colleague about getting scientists on board with education research or really what, you know, what the evidence base is and how do you start convincing skeptical colleagues? Yeah, well, this is a million dollar question, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, so I will just share what my experience has been uh, okay. And David, thank you for the question. And thanks to everybody who's coming. If you have to leave, um, thank you so much for spending time listening to my work. It's very kind. Um, so I think that the one thing I've learned is that evidence from other settings don't convince my colleagues. So, you know, pop it up, you know, there's great, oh my gosh. I mean, I, I do, we do pop up and talk about studies um, that are from the literature about this. But usually what I get is a hand wave, like, well, those are not my students, right? That's not my context. And so it goes back to what I said before, which is I think that the way I've been able to um, sort of engage folks is, well, you know, here's, here's the context of milieu kind of nationally, but let's just see what's going on here. And I'll, I'll just tell one anecdote. Um, I taught with a dear colleague, I will name him. He's in, uh, he's in Australia on um, sabbatical. He's my colleague, Sean Wei Ho. He's a plant molecular biologist. And he was the first person I co-taught with in our large introductory biology course. I never took intro bio because I AP'd out of it. And I certainly never taught 300 people. I learned so much teaching with Sheng Wei, just a fabulous um, scientist and educator. But we started, and I was seeing the first part of the class, and I said, well, we're about to, t we're going to go into 
DNA. And so part of the magic of DNA are these sort of hydrogen bonds, these zippers, you know, where the molecules come apart. And so we really need to understand, is students understand hydrogen bonding, like water? Like, can we just have them draw three water molecules on an index card in the last five minutes of class? So we get some sense of how they're thinking about hydrogen bonds or if they even think about them at all. And so we did that. We don't, we now don't require a textbook, but we require a pack of 99 cent index cards from Walgreens for every course. It's in syllabus. Anyway, so we had students draw those water molecules, not a terribly um, inclusive or, you know, culturally grounded activity, just a way to get some information to us about how students were thinking about in atoms and molecules. And then we went back and we had this stack of 300 index cards and Jen Wei said, well, what do we do now? Which is really great because I think a lot of faculty are like not really sure what to do with that kind of evidence. I was like, we do this very technical thing called pile sorting. <laughs> like and what we're going to do is we're going to sort the ones that have hydrogen bonds that are accurate, the ones that have hydrogen bonds that are inaccurate, the ones that don't have hydrogen bonds. It turns out most of them did not even have appropriate ratios of hydrogen and oxygen. Correct, so correct, correct. Students, <laughs> At San Francisco State, up against any students at any high-profile university with this assessment. Like, I think my students are super bright. Half of them had had chemistry. It was not prereq on chemistry. There's no core. And our, my chemistry instructors were fabulous. But, you know, it's just hard stuff to translate mm -hmm. what you've read in a book or heard someone say into, mm -hmm. like, actually thinking about how you might be the world. And so we, we did the pile sorting. And at the end of, like, really, it didn't take more than... 45 minutes or so, it was pretty clear that less than 15% of our students could accurately draw three water molecules with the appropriate atomic ratio uh, with some representation of charge and some representation of hydrogen bonding. And I think that experience for Sheng Wei, because I've heard him tell the story, was really pivotal because he saw it live in person in his class. And so to go back to David's question, that's a long answer to giving people the tools to science up <laughs> about what's going on in their classroom to open the flow of information from students to faculty, I think is really critical. Um, we're doing that right now in a second HHMI effort. That's the inclusive excellence effort. And the flow of information, instead of being conceptual, is about sense of belonging and what causes students to feel like they belong, what causes students to feel like they're excluded, what causes them to leave the discipline. And so that's that collecting evidence bar yeah. at the bottom of um, right. scientific teaching is trying to collect that evidence live in person ourselves. And not for everybody to have to be an education researcher. It's a pack of index cards and a PowerPoint slide. And then 30 or 45 minutes with a colleague can help you make sense of that data. So that's, I think, what's been most helpful to me. And I haven't studied it. Uh, dear colleagues of mine have. But co-teaching is maybe the most... Um, we haven't studied it, but I think co-teaching is maybe the most organic way to make that happen because if you're on the same team, it doesn't feel like someone's coming in and revealing something, right? That's not, you know, your students don't know X. Like I was in there, I was the one teaching and uh, I was collecting that evidence too. And so I think that partnership and that trust and collecting evidence locally has what gave me a whole bunch of um, insights. And Jamie just asked, how is collecting yes. evidence different than assessment? I think lots of people have baggage with the word assessment, so I don't use it a lot. And they often then narrow it down to be only conceptual things, which it should, doesn't have to be. So I tend to use collecting evidence. And I think this also has to do with identity. My faculty can connect to collecting evidence, even if they can't connect to the word assessment. It's a great question. Lovely. Thank you very much.